Acts chapter 2, verse, we'll start in verse 14. Actually, let's, let's back up at the beginning. We'll, we'll skip some of this for time's sake, but I want to read a little bit at the beginning of the chapter. Acts chapter 2, verse 1, And when the day of Pentecost was fully come, they were all with one accord in one place, and suddenly there came a sound from heaven as of a rushing mighty wind. And it filled all the house where they were sitting, and there appeared unto them cloven tongues like as a fire, and it sat upon each of them. And they were all filled with the Holy Ghost, and began to speak with other tongues as the Spirit gave them utterance. And there were dwelling at Jerusalem Jews, devout men, out of every nation under heaven. Now when this was noised abroad, the multitude came together and were confounded. Now, this is not what I'm preaching on, but I, I, want you, I want to point this out. This is what they were confused about or confounded because that every man heard them speak in his own language. So I'm filled with the Holy Ghost and I began to, to speak. And Bethany, who's from Sida County, can understand me. And the Vogler's from Adams County, they understand. We all have a little bit different dialect, right, within Appalachian. They can understand me and so on. Now, it, literally, though, if someone here was from, that spoke Spanish and someone was here from France and someone was here from, Russian, from Russia, as I spoke, they would hear in their own language, not an unknown language. That's not. What is described here? They heard every man in his own language. Just pointing that out. They were all amazed and marveled, saying one to another, Behold, are not all these which speak Galileans? And how hear we every man in our own language wherein we were born? And it names all those out. Now, of course, in verse 13 it says, that they were mocking them, saying, These men are full of new wine. And here's where I was going to begin reading, verse 14. But Peter, standing up with the eleven, lift up his voice and said unto them, Ye men of Judah, Judea, and all ye that dwell at Jerusalem, be this known unto you, and hearken to my words, for these are not drunken, as ye suppose, seeing it is but the third hour of the day. He said, It's too early for that. But this is that which was spoken by the prophet Joel. And it shall come to pass in the last day, saith God, I will pour out my spirit upon all flesh, and your sons and your daughters shall prophesy, and your young men shall see visions, and your old men shall dream dreams. Now I'm beginning to get to the age where I don't know if I'm seeing visions or dreams. I'm like, I think I'm right in between. And on my servants and on my handmaidens, I will pour out in those days of my spirit, and they shall prophesy. And I will show wonders in heaven above, and signs in the earth beneath, blood and fire and vapor of smoke. The sun shall be turned into darkness, and the moon into blood, before that great and notable day of the Lord come. And it shall come to pass that whosoever shall call on the name of the Lord shall be saved. Ye men of Israel, hear these words. Jesus of Nazareth, a man approved of God among you by miracles and wonders and signs which God did by him in the midst of you, as ye yourselves also know, him being delivered by the determinate counsel and foreknowledge of God ye have taken and by wicked hands have crucified and slain, whom God, amen, hath raised up, having loosed the pains of death because it was not possible that he should be uh, holden of it. For David speaketh concerning him, I foresaw the Lord always before my face, for he is on my right hand that I should not be moved. Therefore did my heart rejoice and my tongue was glad, and moreover also my flesh shall rest in hope, because thou wilt not leave my soul in hell, neither wilt thou suffer thine holy one to see corruption. Thou hast made known to me the ways of life, thou shalt make me full of joy with thy countenance. Men and brethren, let me freely speak unto you of the patriarch David, that he is both dead and buried in the sepulcher with us unto this day. Therefore, being a prophet and knowing that God hath sworn with an oath to him that of the fruit of his loins, according to his flesh, he would raise up Christ. What's that mean? He was of the house and the lineage of David to sit on his throne. 
He's seen this before, spake of the resurrection of Christ, that his soul was not left in hell, neither his flesh should see corruption. This Jesus hath God raised up, where, whereof we all are witnesses. Therefore, being by the right hand of God exalted, and having received of the Father the promise of the Holy Ghost, he hath shed forth this, which ye now see and hear. Peter is, he is explaining to them, this which you don't understand is the Holy Ghost. This thing that is happening that's causing this is the Holy Ghost. He hath shed forth this which ye now see and hear. For David is not ascended unto the heavens, but he saith himself, The Lord said unto my Lord, Sit thou on my right hand until I make thy foes thy footstool. Therefore let all the house of Israel know assuredly that God hath made that same Jesus whom you crucified, both Lord and and Christ. Now I could go on, uh, but I won't. I've, I've read much more than I uh, normally do. Maybe I'll touch on some a little bit later. I know it is a common thought. I have preached sermons in tight with the title or the thought before the purpose or the working of the Holy Ghost, the Holy Spirit. The what is the purpose? And and I want to correct myself now, even though I don't believe I've I've made this mistake yet tonight. But I promise I will. I will refer to the Holy Spirit as an it. That's wrong. The Holy Spirit is a he. Uh, it is, is part of the Godhead, the third person of the Trinity, but we, we've just got it in our minds and we'll say it, and I don't mean any disrespect um, or, or anything like that. But anybody know what I'm talking about? And we, we'll, we'll say, you know, their songs send it on down. And, well, it's not an it. But we have habits, and so I apologize now if I do that. But what is the purpose of the Holy Spirit? What is, uh, not just the purpose, but what are, what are, if we made a list of all the things that the Holy Ghost is capable of or responsible for, we would be here until next year's Super Bowl. It is an endless list and an endless possibility of the things that the Holy Ghost of God is capable of. Does anybody agree with that? If you sit down and begin to think of all the things in your life that the Holy Spirit has worked out on your behalf or has, has made a way in some way or encouraged you in a variety of ways, it's, it is all the working of the Holy Ghost. We know that God, God is everywhere, but as a uh, Godhead, God the Father, we know that even back in the Old Testament that God was where God was and he would choose at times whether the burning bush or the uh, uh, pillar of fire uh, by night, a cloud by day. Uh, his presence would come into the tent or to the tabernacle. We know that God would choose in those ways, but we think of God upon his throne. We think of Jesus Christ, his son, who was born of a virgin, ascended back, as the scripture teaches, ascended back to sit at the right hand of God the Father. And folks, all of that is true, but it is the Holy Spirit of God that dwells among men around us and lives within us that makes us alive in Christ. For the Bible teaches us that if you have not the Spirit of Christ, you are none of His. And we can get into doctrinal issues about uh, what some people believe different things are. Tim and I were discussing, uh, uh, not, not we were in total agreement, but whether people, those that believe in, in uh, speaking in tongues is the evidence uh, of the Holy Ghost or, or those from the holiness movement and sanctification and believing what, what happens in that time. I'm not here to preach about any of that, but I'm here to say this that I do not believe that a person is regenerated, born again of God, unless something of God moves inside of that person. There has to be a move of God that comes not just on the outside, Tim, but on the inside. Many years ago, I was preaching revival uh, down south, and uh, it was a tremendous meeting. And boy, about like I got blessed this morning singing, I got blessed like that preaching. And for I don't know how long, I had no idea where I was even at. Now, it's been a long time since I felt that. that. I was younger then. I guess I could handle a little bit better. But I mean, I absolutely got, got lost in the spirit. And when the service was, we had a great service, and the altar was just lined with two people. And uh, that's what evangelists say. No, there was, there was a bunch of people there. And after the service, I went to the back and, and shaking hands. And this, this old man, never saw him before, never saw him since, didn't know his name. 
But he must have been, and again, I'm not here. I, I, I worship with, with Pentecostals. I worship with people speaking tongues. We'll have them come here and worship. I have, I have no issue, okay? Uh, that's between them and God. I'll just say this. He must have been Pentecostal, and, and uh, he came afterward. He, he was kind of emotional and crying a little bit. And he said, Brother, I don't know where you're from. I don't know you. And he shook my hand, just a little old man. He said, uh, are, are you Pentecostal? And I said, no, sir. And he said, well, you almost got it. And, uh, and I looked at him in brotherly love, and I grinned. I was, I was a lot younger then, probably still in my 20s. And I looked at him, and, and I did. I, I, I meant it in love. I said, I don't almost have anything. I've got all of God that I need, and I don't mean that I can't continue to experience him. But when I got saved, J.M., the Holy Spirit of God took up residence. I am the temple of the Holy Ghost. I'm a born-again, blood-bought child of the living God whose spirit dwells within his vessel. Amen. Yes, I believe in sanctification, and I believe that I had an experience with God in which I sold out and consecrated my life to him. I was dealing with some things and, and was he calling me to preach and was I going to accept it? And Paul, I'm sure you remember going through the same, but I felt like I couldn't get close enough to him to know for sure if he was calling. And so the first thing I had to do was get over the fact that I would do it before God would really answer if he was or not. Beth and I lived in a house in Waverly, our first house, just a, a, little, uh, a little house over there. And... Uh, People are buying vehicles now for more than we paid for that first house. And we had a spare bedroom. And it was all, you know, fixed up. And I went into that. Actually, I think we called that Jessica's bedroom. That was for long before she was married. And she comes come stay with us. And, uh, but I went in that bedroom and nobody was home. And I began to pray. I got down beside that spare bed and began to pray. And I prayed and I prayed and I prayed. I'm guessing at that time I was about 20, I was still probably about 22 years old. And I began to pray like, a, like I was 80 years old. And I got down to, oh, I feel the Lord tonight. I got down to business with God. And I said, God, I don't know what you're calling me to do. But Lord, I, I want you to know, I don't want to do it, but I'll do whatever it is. And I said, God, if there's anything within me that you don't want to be there, then Lord, remove it. And I don't know what came across me, Chrissy, but I got up. I leaned over and there was a window. I unlatched that window and I raised it up and I said, God, anything in me that you don't want to take it out the window. And folks, he sanctified me wholly to his will that night. Did something in me that I've never forgotten. But none of that has made me that I cannot sin. Amen. Or that I will not sin. I've got to keep my relationship up to date with him. I've got to rely upon him every single day and trust him. And my will must continually die out to his. And folks, we've heard it preached many times and it's made it almost sound like if we get sanctified or again filled with the Holy Ghost, evidence by speaking in tongues or whatever it is, some I believe, boy, we just put it on cruise control to glory. That's not how it works. I've got to trust him for the rest of my days. The rest of my days, every day. And so we think of the working of the Holy Ghost. Number one, it was a witness to the believer. Those people that were gathered there praying in the upper room, Jesus had given them instruction and they, they went back to Jerusalem and they tarried there until they would be endued with power. Now, they didn't understand, but Jesus had told them, it is expedient that I go because if I don't go, then the great comforter, the comforter cannot come. I am going that he might come. Now listen, I don't believe they quite understood what was about to happen, but they carried out his word and they go back to Jerusalem. And they're in the upper room and the Bible says they're in one accord and they're praying. And all of a sudden something happened. God began to shake in a sense the earth and the building and their hearts and their souls. And I love this when it says that all of the house was filled. It wasn't just talking about the rooms and the closets, but every soul that was in there was filled with the Holy Ghost of God. And they had an experience with him. Listen, they were already, in a sense, believers, followers of Christ but they were about to experience something that they never had. Now, 
The reason being, God had not, that dispensation had not happened. It had not taken place yet. So this was the first, what we see recording, of the Holy Spirit coming in this manner that he may fill the believer. And it was a witness to them that what they had believed in their mind was now evidence but what they could sense of the peace of God inside of them. And I'm here to tell you the Holy Ghost makes all the difference. And I'm about to prove it to you. That long sermon that I didn't even finish quite reading all of it, who was doing the talking? The Apostle Peter. The Apostle Peter was the most up and down, emotional, turbulent disciple of them all. Oh, Lord, I'll never, I'll never leave you. I'll never forsake you. I'll follow you to the very end. I'll follow you even unto death. And just a short time later, he's like, I don't know him. You know, like when we're at ball games, the way Bethany acts. People are like, isn't that your wife? I'm like, I don't, never seen her. I know Jan's done it. I've seen his wife at ball game too. Well, no, we just happened to walk in at the same time. That's what he did. He denied him. Jesus said you would. You'll deny me three times before the cock crows. Oh, no, no, no. I'll, I'll be right there. And right on time, three times. He would doubt. He would argue. Oh, no, no, no. This can't happen this way. No, no, you can't wash my feet. I must wash your feet. I mean, he was just all over the place. His, his heart was in the right place, but his flesh was always in the wrong place. But I want you to know, after the day of Pentecost, Peter was never the same. He found a constant. He found something that held him. He found something that helped him keep his emotions in check, something that helped keep his flesh in check something that helped keep his fear and his doubt and the up and down, something that steadied him. And the greatest thing that we can find within the Holy Spirit is something that'll keep us, not just when we're shouting, but keep us when we're down. Not just keep us during revival, but keep us, amen, on Sunday night as well. It was a witness to the believer. Secondly, it was power. I love this. Power for the preacher. Peter came out of there and everybody's looking around. They're like, these, look at these drunk men, which I don't quite understand. I mean, I guess they probably were putting on a real good show. But all of a sudden, these people are like, these are Galileans. They, they speak a certain language, and all of us are hearing it. They're from all over the Bible, listen to them. Or wherever they were in all their languages, and they're saying, we're hearing this. Now, why they thought that made them drunk? I've seen a lot of drunks. I ain't never seen any, I never seen a drunk. English speaking person all of a sudden start drinking, speaking Spanish. Now they start speaking an unknown language. But they said they're drunk. Peter said, listen, man. He got there and said, now listen. It's too early in the day for that. That's not what's happening here. That's not what's happening here. He goes in. He begins to preach. That's what I read is his sermon. Greater than any sermon I've ever preached. He goes on and he's describing, uh, he's describing Jesus. He's describing the relationship in David and the prophesying of David, what it all meant. Verse 37 says, Now when they heard this, they were pricked in their heart and said unto Peter and to the rest of the apostles, Men and brethren, what shall we do? And Peter said unto them, Repent and be baptized every one of you in the name of Jesus Christ for the remission of sins, and you shall receive the gift of the Holy Ghost. For the promises unto you and to your children and to all that are far off, even as many as the Lord our God shall call. And with many other words did he testify. It wasn't all that he said. This is all that's recorded. He did testify and exhort, saying, Save yourselves from this untoward generation. And then they were gladly received the word, were baptized. And the same day there were added unto them about five 
thousand souls. There is power to the preacher to preach a word of God that 5,000 people heard and believed and accepted and were baptized after they repented of their sin. I'm here to tell you, I put together some pretty good sermons in my life. Some might even be good enough to go in a book if anybody would ever read it. I mean, they're good stuff. But I've also got behind the desk when God laid something on my heart about 10 seconds before I stepped up and I preached and seen the Holy Ghost move and people give their heart to the Lord and people be healed and people be helped. God reminds us it's not about how good we put it together. It's what he does when it comes up. Woo, hallelujah. The Holy Ghost is power to the preacher. I don't recommend preachers make a habit of getting up unprepared, but I believe, oh, I believe once in a while he does it to us just to remind us. You think you put together a pretty good sermon? Let me just show you something. Let me just scare you to death. All the years that Mark's been preaching, what did he say? He got that sermon about two days ago. I know him. He doesn't wait two days before he's going to preach before he has a sermon together. Every once in a while, God just wants to say, I want to remind you the power in preaching comes from me. Again, we have to do our part. I don't believe in just consistently getting up and winging it as some of the old ones used to. I'd say, well, I just get up and God fill my mouth. Kyrie Evans used to say, yeah, he'll fill it with hot air. <clears throat> you should study and do your due diligence and prepare. But all those times when the power shows up. But thirdly, not, is the Holy, not only is the Holy Ghost a witness to the believer, power to the preacher, it is conviction to the lost. The same Holy Spirit that does, has done all these other things is the same Holy Spirit that convicts the lost when nothing else will work. You know, speaking of because of what the Scripture talked about, them thinking they were full of wine, they were drunk. I'm sure most of us knows if you've ever been in these situations, you cannot reason with a drunk. You just can't reason. I mean, they're not, obviously they're not thinking clearly. Have you know you cannot reason with a lost person? You can't reason with them. You can't win an argument. Although, again, I believe in knowing the Bible that we can present a good and compelling case and an explanation of Scripture, an explanation of God's plan of salvation that we might witness. All that is absolutely true. But at the end of the day, you'll never argue good enough to convince somebody into being saved. What will happen? Now, the Holy Spirit may use your argument he may use that discussion or that love that they get from you, that burden that they sense from you. He may use that, but it ultimately it will be the Holy Spirit that convicts. When I was under conviction as a 20-year-old, I never once, never once, and I still lived at home. We were at Morgantown. I'd been saved when I was a young boy, and like most teenagers, Drifted away, in and out, and then had really been away from the Lord for a long time. And I knew I was. And in that time in my life, you know not one, not one person ever came and tried to convince me that I needed to be saved. You know why? I already knew. There was nothing that anyone could tell me that I didn't already know. I'd heard it my entire life, three times a week, just three times if I was lucky, not counting revivals or other services we went and visited. I knew it all in a sense. I knew what I needed to do. And so I do remember some people coming and, and that were carrying a burden from not just my parents and family, but even people from the church. You know, they had watched me grow up and they would come and hug me and send me cards, hand me notes, praying for you, just praying for you. None of that worked. It was good and it bothered me. It didn't work. You know what happened? 
through people's prayers, all of a sudden, it wasn't them talking to me. It was when no one was around. I could not escape the convicting and compelling power of the Holy Ghost. When I tried to sleep at night, he was on my mind. He would not relent. He would not let go. He would not give up. I'd be in a car by myself and I could not turn the music up louder and louder and louder to try to drown out the Holy Spirit speaking. I've told you before, but I can remember being at parties or places where it was loud, a lot of people or music or whatever. And in that moment, I didn't hear God. I didn't, I didn't sense God. But if I got outside of that when it was quiet, I could, the Holy Spirit would get right on me. He would get right on me and he'd always say the same thing in my heart. He'd say, you know better. He would remind me, J.M., he'd say, there's people in there that don't know any better. They don't know right from wrong. They don't know about me, but you, son, know better. And I fight as I could. I'd get back in the crowd of noise to drown him out. But finally came a point in my life where I could not escape him. It was the convicting power of the Holy Ghost. It was fear and dread that came on for my eternal soul. I did not want to die lost. I'd heard about hell and its flames and the eternal punishment. And I knew enough to call out on God. He gloriously saved me. Praise the Lord. Praise the Lord. For Holy Ghost conviction. How many of you are here tonight? Because of the convicting power of the Holy Ghost. Not because somebody talked you into it. I'm okay if I've always, we don't do it. It's very rare here that somebody will go to somebody at, at an altar service. I always caution people, if you're going to do that, you, be, you better be sure it's the Holy Spirit. I never tell someone, you know, that they did wrong. I'm just saying you got to be careful. And uh, we have to be careful that we're not, even with our altar calls, that we're not convincing someone because it won't hold up. Or we do everything we can do and we pry and we move them. I'm, I'm getting older, but I'd say there's still at least a few old women I could wrestle up to the altar. And shove their head down on the stage. <laughs> Except Jesus. But it wouldn't work, would it? Oh, but when he moves, when he moves, it's real. And it's everlasting. Are you thankful for the Holy Spirit?